Hey everybody, this is Blair Hodges, and you're listening to a special S'mores episode. It's a bonus episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges. And we're revisiting an episode from earlier in the season with Tom Wyman about hope and parenthood. And we're going to dissect it a little bit and talk about it a little bit more in depth with a friend of mine named Tara Boyce. She's a fantastic writer. She has a sub stack that you'll hear about in the interview. Thanks for being here, and let's dive in. It's a S'mores episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges. Tara Boyce, welcome to Fireside with Blair Hodges. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Have you ever heard the song, I Want to Be a Mother? No. Okay. But I hate it already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, by way of background for listeners, we both, Tara and I, come from a Mormon background, and I had this record growing up by Janine Brady, uh, and it had all these really wonderful songs. One of them was about how paying tithing to the church is great, and one of them was like becoming a Mormon missionary, and one of them is I want to be a mother, and let's take a look. <laughs> let's let's take a listen to this. When I grow up, I want to be a mother and have a family. One little, two little, three little babies of my own. Of all the jobs for me, I choose no So, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like that song really kind of describes your, yes. your life. Yes, it's like, this is going to be so beautiful and magical and cozy and cookies. And literally, when I was deciding to, when, with my husband, who was always like, sure, yeah, let's have kids. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about it before. <laughs> um, I was like thinking about Christmas morning of like how oh. cute and fun it would be. And so I chose that's to have parenting. <laughs> I chose to have kids. <laughs> well, there's yellow balloons, there's cookies. <laughs> yeah. Right. And those parts are and can be magical and they're also sometimes chaos. Yeah. But all right. You ready to talk about hope? <laughs> sure. All right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> We're gonna take a look back at a conversation we had with Tom Wyman. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, I suggest checking it out before you dive into this one. I invited a friend to come and talk about the episode from her perspective. It's Tara Boyce, and she's author of a really great substack called This Is My Restoration. You can find that at thisismyrestoration.substack. Now, Tara, as a writer, when I reached out to do a podcast, I'm just wondering how that felt. I don't know if you've done a lot of interviews before. No, I have not. Um, other than Marco Polo with oh. friends. <laughs> That's a little Which bit Which feels different. like an interview. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. Um, I've, I was actually really nervous because... I've always been a writer for the reason that speaking makes me kind of nervous. And writing allows me to sit on my thoughts more and find the right word, edit, get to that like nugget of what I'm really trying to say. Whereas writing or as speaking, I'm more kind of bumbly. I, I, you know what? I actually feel that way too, honestly. Yeah, um, maybe a lot of people do, but yeah, like being on this side of the microphone, I have the advantage of having a script that I've like written out beforehand. And this, these s'mores episodes are kind of more free flowing, so I, I share a little bit of your nervousness too. Uh, just full disclosure. <laughs> the reason that I wanted to talk to you though is because I had read something a really really powerful essay that you wrote, and I read this around the time that Tom Wyman's episode came out. So to remind people. 
uh, Tom Wyman did a book about whether it was ethical or right to become a parent right now. So he's thinking about ecological crisis. He's thinking about suffering. He's thinking about pain and whether it's right or not to introduce new life into those situations. And he's a philosopher, so he comes at it from philosophical studies that he's done at university, kind of thinking about what hope is and the ethics, I think, of being a parent. And he's doing it before he's become a parent and in the process of becoming one. So his child's born during that time. Your essay is very different. Your essay is more memoir. It's very, it's personal. It's exploratory. It's talking from the midst of being a parent, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in how this essay came about. Tell us a little bit about this essay. It's called Holes Are Generally Suspicious Things. Okay, so this is the essay I wrote in the midst of writing an essay about motherhood <laughs> so you're supposed to be writing an essay about motherhood. i'm trying to write about coming into motherhood the reasons why how it was some of the the trauma and sorrow there and it's a it's a huge emotional project and i set a time a day to try to finish a draft i suspected i wouldn't actually finish but that was the goal <laughs> and i arranged babysitting and that morning, my daughter wakes up with a giant hole in her tooth. Like, suddenly, the cavity has appeared. Obviously, it's been working its magic, but this is the moment we realize, and it's a crisis. And I have to literally decide whether or not to address this yeah. crisis or You've write about my motherhood. Yeah. And it just turned out that I, I ended up taking my daughter in, and it ended up just being a day of of parenting an exacerbating day my daughter also my youngest ended up barfing on me at the end of the day yeah so it just was it was not a typical day but it was a common experience that happens as a parent yeah, and especially like as a mother who is right now currently full-time caregiver yeah, like this is an essay. Like you said, it's not necessarily a typical day, but it is definitely a parent's yes. day. Like, this I mean, kind of even stuff, this morning, yeah. getting up to get ready to come here. I live in Springville, so it's an hour drive, which is a luxury to just drive by myself yeah. here. It is, it is, it is a nice break. That's you time <laughs> in the car, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I've already had my antibiotics. I'm good. I had strep throat. My daughter did, so I got her antibiotics she's good and then my husband woke up this morning is like my throat hurts mm -hmm. right and he's the one who's supposed to be watching the kids this morning and i was going to get up early and kind of get some notes together and it's just this is what yeah this is what parenting is it feels like constant interruptions to your plans or not necessarily plans just like what you're trying to do yes <laughs> I find myself saying, like, why can't things just be the way that they should have been? Like, why, like, why can't I just, like, ever do what I want to do, yeah. how I want to do why it? Why can't it just happen how it should? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I relate. Like, we've had some sickness here at the house the same way. You can lay out all these plans, but the real world, and especially with parenting, the real world's going to impinge on those. And I think looking at, like, Tom's book... It's talking about hope, and when you think about hope as a parent, it's I guess it 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 can be easier to have hope without like before you've really been into the middle of what it's really like. Also, you had certain expectations of becoming a parent that mm -hmm. have changed since you became a parent, right? Mm -hmm. Talk maybe a little bit about your background and your upbringing and kind of what you expected of motherhood. So I have a mother who loved mothering she's a very naturally caring empathetic nurturing person um she loved it we felt like the center of her world she enjoyed that and it's kind of interesting because later in her life she could no longer just be mothering she had to go to work and it was it was really hard for her she wanted to just be there with us and so i grew up with this idea and i was the oldest daughter I grew up with this idea that I would always be a mother. I was even telling some friends, like, they were expressing what they wanted to be when they were little and all this stuff. And I'm like, I always just wanted to be a mom. Like, I just, I saw my mom doing it. She seemed so good at it. 
I was the oldest sister. I loved my little siblings. I loved my stuffed animals. And it was like, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. It was it was pitched to me as this way of creating a world and a and like a nest, a cozy nest for your little family. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounded so beautiful. And I think that is how it is still pitched. Is like you get to bring this little life and create this world for your child. And that is true in some ways. So you didn't share any of the existential anxiety maybe that Tom talked about then. Like no. you didn't think I, about And like I the was world. taken care of enough. My parents made enough money. I was one of six children and so it was always like we weren't like rolling around in the dough or had mm-hmm. treats ever or like could buy like get a lot of gifts or anything. I just was taken care of. So the concept of I may not be able well, one, I may not even be able to have children. Mm-hmm. Like, that didn't even cross my mind. Yeah. I assumed, and I was also raised Mormon, so I believed that being a mother was my role on earth and in eternity. Mm-hmm. And so it never crossed my mind that anything that wasn't God's will would get in the way of me being a mother, and specifically a stay at home mother. I write in other essays about, like, I remember writing in my journal that I would be a stay-at-home mom because I had gathered from information I had heard and read that this was the best and most righteous thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I also assumed that if I chose the most righteous thing to do, I would also have a lot of joy and fulfillment in that choice because both things were promised to me. Yeah, and you lacked that that existential anxiety because and this I was didn't actually have concepts. Plan. Yeah, I didn't have concepts of like maybe you wouldn't be able to afford being a stay at home mom. Maybe you wouldn't be able to have children. Like mm-hmm. I have, infertility wasn't. I on the have radar, family yeah. members who've only been mothers of miscarried babies, mm-hmm. right? And so, but that just faith seemed to triumph all of that for me, and then the way I understood things, and so that was just where I was going to go. And so that's what I wanted to be. And so I think that's why the reality of motherhood was such such a bomb in my life. Like mm-hmm. it just – it impacted me so differently than anything I had thought or been told. And so I had to kind of create a new way of seeing it. Yeah, this is one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you because you just brought hope to the equation, right? Yeah. Tom's book is like, Automatic. should we have hope? Yeah, I, I, I hoped. Yeah, you, just the hope was there. And then you hit into a reality that then would challenge what your hope had maybe promised. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so let's explore that a little bit about like what the realities of becoming a parent have been like for you then because you you didn't you, – you brought the hope from the get-go <laughs> and then you kind of reality sort of challenged that hope after the fact. Yeah. So um, I think what was really hard, particularly as a mother who was able to conceive and carry babies, is it really impacted my physical body, my hormones, my brain. A lot of moms talk about – and and science also shows this, the way your brain changes after pregnancy and childbirth. It rewires and allocates resources in different ways for you and your child. And it's it's such an adjustment, like your body is so changed just carrying a child. And then after the fact as well, I had such bad postpartum depression. And mm-hmm. and there's like this this sorrow when I look back at those early years after my babies were born, and this is why I've chosen to write about motherhood is because I've avoided it so long, mm. is but it's this sorrow that kind of like it like sits in my gut because there's a lot of pain there in this moment that I always thought or believed based on my own hope and naivete and also what I was told, I I thought it would be this beautiful thing. And it, it felt like my death. Mm. It felt like my annihilation. And I mean that in multiple ways. It felt like my body was destroyed. My mental health upended. And I, that was the first time I, 
I had always struggled sometimes with mood or hard times, but never depression where I sunk into that, what I call the black hole. And so the arrival of motherhood came with a lot of darkness and hardness. And so when I think about it, when I talk about it, it's still it's still there. So there was a book that I wanted to do for Fireside with a philosopher who wrote a book called Transformative Experience. And she's a philosopher, but I think I think the the gendered nature of her approach made a difference compared to like kind of what Tom was doing. Mm -hmm. And she was basically saying there are decisions that we make in our lives that can't really be rational decisions, no matter how rational we think they are, because making the decision changes things in ways that we could never anticipate or never like expect. And parenting is one of these where you could have every friend tell you parenting is the best Mm -hmm. or, or parenting's avoided. It's really bad. Um, but you until you know. actually, yeah, there's really no way. And she actually, there's a really funny thought experiment she uses, which is like, suppose all your friends come to you and they fall, become vampires. <laughs> and they say, Tara, being a vampire is the best. Like we know it sounds yes, weird. Yes. Yeah. We know it sounds weird. <laughs> Sold. Yes. Uh, but trust us, we've got ethical ways to get blood. Like you don't have to worry about any of that. <laughs> you get to live forever and it's super rad, but you, you cannot make a rational choice in that instance because you have to become that thing and experience it before you can really know what it's like and i think that perspective really i think nuances tom's approach which he's sort of talking about you know having hope beforehand and making a decision based in hope but you've really got to recognize that shadow side that you can't really anticipate whether that hope will pay off or what the consequences will be and it sounds like you experience that like that intrinsic hope that you brought to what it would be to be a mom yeah i didn't i didn't know how my particular body and brain would respond to pregnancy i didn't know i'd have postpartum depression i didn't know i had adhd at the time in fact motherhood and mothering exacerbated a lot of my stress and situation and so that i then even notice these problems but yeah it was it's a transformation and it's a risk it is never a guarantee but like m- most things in life but it does particularly impact a woman carrying a child in a way that a father will have no way to understand mm-hmm. not as an accusation mm-hmm. but just a difference that's it i you know it's just a reality I, and I think the same goes for like uh, adoptive parents or people that foster and things like yeah. this, like the, the experiences of sleep. those. Yes. And, and or how labor is divided yeah. between partners or what it's like to be a single parent and, and juggle these things. Yeah. So however parenting happens, you know, you can try to anticipate stuff. You can have these hopes. But again, they're going to bump up against a reality that could challenge those. This is one of the points that you said you wanted to kind of bring up as well as we looked through the old episode and is the object of hope, right? And mm-hmm. and how that makes a difference. Like what you're hoping for matters a ton. You can't just think about hope in the abstract. You're actually hoping for specific things and that makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's two things, if I remember, that I want to talk about with this. One is like hope for me has had to change as a mom. Like I, I can't wake up and be like, I hope today is a good one. I hope I'm not interrupted. I hope I'm just, it goes smoothly because that almost leads to more disappointment because it won't. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's possible kind of, but it's really not that possible enough to kind of justify hoping in that without kind of hurting more because you're striving for that thing and that's like so dashed, hard dashed expectations yeah so. and not just the expectation but just like the striving to get something that's not is so outside of your control <laughs> and so my hope has to adjust to like i hope i can show up like full-heartedly i hope i can be present i hope i can find moments of joy and love and connection because that's I, I don't know if it's because that's what I have control over or have some say in. I don't know. But to hope for things that just can't be as a parent makes it harder. 
right? Right. <laughs> to hope to come to this podcast without my my caregiver having strep throat and everyone. <laughs> yeah. You know, like it just it doesn't it doesn't work as well. It ends up being more frustrating. I think that's what it is. It's more it, hoping in those things you can't really do creates more frustration and more burden. And I like to kind of think of it. You are a jazz fan, right? <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, following you on Twitter. Speak the Utah jazz in particular. I mean, I also like jazz music. Yeah, and jazz like, music. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was assuming basketball. Yes. And I used to play basketball. And so I'm thinking of, you know, is it ethical as a team? There's two minutes left. I don't know about ethical, but let's think about rash. I don't know what word we'd use, but you're down by 30. Okay. Are you going to win? Hoping for the win is silly, stupid, irrational, because yeah. based on the rules and boundaries and confines of basketball, points are only worth so many. Right? Yeah. You've got three-pointers, two-pointers, free throws. There's rules about who gets the ball when. There's boundaries, etc. And so to be like, at this point in the game, let's just give it all we've got to win. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you cannot... Score that many points in two minutes. Yeah, it's, it's literally impossible, yeah. And so that's where it's like, hope is interesting to me because the object of the hope seems to make all the difference. At that moment, it seems like the a, a good coach has to change the object, right? Okay, we're not going to win, but what are we going to hope for now, right? Do we want to win games down the road? Should we should we sit out our starting five and put put some of our younger players in, give them that experience and just say, let's see how we can close the gap, right? There's like an adjustment. And the you goal ha- changes completely. The goal yeah. changes. And then hope can be the thing that gets you off that bench. But the object of that hope, like you're not going to get off the bench if you're down by 30, and the goal is to win. Yeah. If you can't maintain that. Or you goal. could. You could be driven by duty, right? And this is why I played in games where we were down. <laughs> and you just keep going. But you're like, this is depressing. Yeah. I'm wasting my time because I wanted to win. And that's just a game. Like, imagine <laughs> that game. level of disappointment like in life. <laughs> and in life. And life's so much more complicated because it's not so finite and so obvious what the rules and possibilities are and opportunities now sometimes there are there's laws there's these kinds of things and they impact people differently and in different ways and you have to take that into consideration when you are finding objects of hope right but yeah that's where hope i think also requires like wisdom knowledge of what really is and what what is within your means and possibilities. Yeah. So it's almost like I I found myself when I was like thinking about what to say today is I kept trying to come to this conclusion, almost like confirmation bias, like why is hope good? And I kept asking like, how is it bad though? (laughs) Yeah. Right. You know, like when is it, when is it better to just be like yeah we're losing let's just let's go out and have some fun like let's just let's let's just smile while we do it give the crowd a show yeah and i see that in in your essay here to go back to the dentist thing like you're with your daughter at this dentist appointment and you're holding her hand Mm -hmm. and the essay kind of talks about this list maybe that you keep running in your head. I don't know if you want it to run or not, but it's basically (laughs) like the pros and cons are like the goods and bads. You're thinking about, am I a good parent? Is this relationship good? Will my kids grow up and like, think of me as a good mom? Am I hurting them in some psychological way? Like if I stack up all of the beautiful parenting moments on one side of the scale and stack up all the times that I shout at them or get frustrated or just kind of have a parenting fail on the other side of the scale, how is that going to balance out in the end? And you're hoping that you're holding your daughter's hand. It's a really beautiful scene. She's squeezing your hand. She's in pain. She's having something really scary happen at the dentist. They're working on this cavity, which involves drilling and pain. And you're saying like, you hope that these little hand squeezes and this hand holding will be remembered by her. And that maybe there'll be this accumulation of hand squeezing moments that, that will end up 
just being with her throughout her life is something beautiful, but you're not sure because you also feel like yeah. bad moments are accumulating too. <laughs> yeah. Um, both in, both in my relationship with her and each of my children and also in my experience as a mom, right? Like in addition to holding her hand is sweet and we have this connection and I love my child, there's so much around that moment that sucks so much in that yeah. day that it's like, was that hand holding worth this quantity of suck? And even no. like problems that kids will bring. No, to not like to me, actually. Yeah. yeah. And maybe down the road, because I'm still in the middle of it, and they, this is where hope comes in, is maybe down the road, because we've had these good connecting moments, my daughter and I will have a relationship that the good outweighs the bad yeah. as a mother. Going both but ways, I can't. Too. Yes, I can't even guarantee that. I mean, how many of us hate our parents? <laughs> For the record, or, I don't. But yeah. I don't either. I don't either, mom but, and dad. But, but I will say this, though. like It, it does become complicated. It I does. Have, it, is not a, it is not a certainty. Yeah, exactly. And that's what hope is, is. It's not a certainty. Parenting is not. And I think... I think a lot of parents do. They they put so much into their children and they do it in the ways they know how, mm -hmm. are capable of. And sometimes it creates a beautiful thing in the end or later in life, the last third or whatever, if you live that long, right? And then sometimes it doesn't. No. And, and there's wedges really do and it's a sorrow. And yeah. some parents do hurt their kids yeah. and their kids are like, you did all this work, but yeah. you also hurt me so much. I never yeah. want to talk to you again. That's right. Yeah. Again, like why? Why do we parent? Is the real question. Yeah. 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 I do not have an answer for you. Yeah, we're still working other than on it. I feel like it's, I would lie to. Yeah. And it's like I think like the fact that we keep going kind of is the answer in the sense that like that's the only answer we have. Like it's different from the basketball game in that there's not we don't know the clock. You know? Yeah, we, we don't, don't know, know how much, much points a yeah. hand holding is. Yeah. So I wonder like how much of a difference that makes too. Like we, yeah. ultimately we don't know. I like thinking of that thought experiment of a game like when your expectations have to change mm -hmm. and like what's the point when those expectations change. I think that's a really helpful way to think about parenting. But yeah, there's no, I don't know how much time's on this clock, so <laughs> I, I can, I relate to that. But it's still, to, to go back to the essay, to see you holding her hand, and then there's another moment in here, too, I wanted to mention, because this, this pertains, I think, to Tom's point, too. Tom was worried about the pain that children would face. Like, when you're mm -hmm. bringing a child into the world, you know that they're going to have, if they live any particular amount of time they'll encounter pain heartache sorrow difficulty it could even include your own death like mm -hmm. how sad is it to think about your kids being sad uh, you know and losing you if you have a great relationship um you talk about her raising her hand when she feels pain mm -hmm. so i think it's something the dentist probably told her to do yes, right it's like, yeah. raise your hand and so what a brave first of all what a brave thing for a kid to do I know, she's so awesome yeah so like she's <laughs> raise her hand like this hurts but then you talk about how like your essay itself is kind of a raising of your own hand of yeah. saying like i feel pain in this situation and you're raising your hand to manifest that yeah it was a really poignant moment for me and those don't exist every day and as a mother or a person. Which is hard when you have a sub stack and you want to write some good content. But yeah. <laughs> like, what can I make of this <laughs> yeah. crap? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she, she, Eleanor, so, she's so interesting and brave and just so alive and so herself. And I, I do, I, I don't feel like I can take all the credit for that, but I, I almost in some ways I'm endeared to my own self when I see my children um, doing things I've hopefully I, I have tried to help to give and shape in them. One of which is your body, your pain, what you feel, what you experience matters. And so when she's getting drilled, <laughs> which we were unsure if it would be a root canal, it was that bad. And she raises her hand that it hurts. It was like, oh, my gosh, my daughter is in pain and she knows that her pain matters. 
And, and I'm thinking about as a ch- when I was a child. I don't know why. I don't know how. But I would have been too scared. Mm. I would have just done it. I was afraid and nervous about talking to adults and drawing attention to anything about me that was burdensome. And so seeing my daughter do that was just was beautiful. And I've had this concept with mothering because as a child, my mother loved me and taught me to love who I was as well. And that those things about me, my pain and stuff mattered. But it was like, at what moment did that change? Right. And I've had to confront this because my children are all daughters and they may or may not um, choose to be mothers. And at what point does what they go through and what they hurt through stop mattering as much as the children they raise. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like motherhood in many ways, as much as people like to say it doesn't, like requires pain and sacrifice. You don't even necessarily want to give, but will Mm -hmm. out of love. But And sometimes out of necessity. (laughs) And out of necessity, or like, how do I get my child to stop jumping on my head, right? And so it's this thing that I just keep... Going around, and it's in the essay I'm going to release today, actually, about when did I become a mom whose needs and pain didn't matter as much as, a, as my children's? And that's, and that's hard, because I don't think in our society with our resources, it has to be this hard for moms, you know? Sorry, yeah, I'm touching you, on a lot no, of things no, there. Pro- but I think that's important to point out. Like, why right? Why... Why does parenting this beautiful, wonderful, vibrant child, Eleanor, require so much from me for her to be happy? Like, is there a way that we can both be happy, even if not equally? But like, why do I have to suffer this so much so she can? Yeah, and I think you're talking probably structurally. So like what gender roles and gender expectations? Yes. Um, The stats are clear. Uh, the extra that women yeah. are the ones who often put in more time in the home, even if they work out and when they work outside the home, they're often ones who still put in more than their partners. This is something that my partner and I have really or that I, I should say I, that mm-hmm. my partner and I have experienced that I've been trying to grow better yeah. into this. I've been a feminist at, at like in my mind for quite a long time not as much in action as much as I would want to be. Mm. And we see that in like the amount of labor that she performs, the the kids default to asking her stuff, um, this kind of thing. Right. So you're you're talking about those. Yeah. And it's also, it's so much, it's so much weight on a partner. If there is a partner, right. If you're a single parent, then it's on you. And also just structurally, like in a lot of, other cultures outside of America, or, and, and I don't, I wouldn't even just say America, maybe more white America. White America is often that insular family. Yeah. And we're often living away from parents or help, or these parents are having to work later and later into their, into reti- past retirement, right. normal age. And it just, it just seems like so much is put on one or two partners and it's too much for either of us to hold, right? Like so, my husband yeah. with his hurting back and strip it yeah. at well, home look, trying e- to watch the kids. So economically and professionally too, right? We have a 40 hour work week. Yes. Five days. How do we work around it? Yeah. My, my friends work like no one is available to help. There's no childcare. There's no, Unless you can afford it. And even then that those caregivers are available or willing. And right? if you, yeah. Yeah. If you can afford it, if you can find people um, and then what cost is it incurring on their lives as yeah, well? Like you're exactly. passing along the burden. Yeah. You're it's a hard along, thing. It's a hard yeah. thing in and of itself. And yeah, it's just. Uh, it didn't. Here's the thing. It didn't have to be like this we did not have to have it's an improvement on things the 40-hour work week was a success for labor like getting it down to that but why stop here like why my wife and i've been talking about this this summer she's now employed in the school district so she gets to take time off 
um, well, you know, she'll be off with the kids during summer break and I'm not, yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to be working throughout the whole, <laughs> right. And so she's like, we're going to the zoo and we're doing this and this. And I'm like jealous. I'm looking yeah. at that and being like, man, like I would I love know. to do some of that stuff. And I, I have this job. I can't do that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how people do it. Not to, to, to bring us to some despairing. Yeah. Dark <laughs> well, this is why, this is why this conversation matters. Like I, I really love Tom's interview I th- and I want people to listen to it. And I think even as I was doing the interview, I kept thinking about how much more it could be expanded, how much more there was to say, and, and especially how much women could bring to the table and being the ones often who are actually bearing the children, the, uh, the ones who are often taking on more of the emotional labor, um, the house organizational labor, just because of these, you know, we both grew up in a Mormon tradition mm-hmm. where it's highly patriarchal. Men are said to be the providers. Women mm-hmm. are said to be the nurturers. And which, they both, yeah, they both come with their own particular challenges, which create a very different perspective on hope and objects yeah. of hope. Yeah. And, and why divide it that way anyway? Like why <laughs> situate it to where, Here's your jobs, here's your jobs, and everyone needs to fit this mold. Yeah. Yeah. I think that – and it it really shaped your hope pre-motherhood, like how Mm -hmm. motherhood would look, which, again, you bumped up into the reality of lived motherhood in ways that challenged all those hopes. And and the basketball game changed, basically. Yeah, You got put in the game, and and the game changed. Yeah, and my own own body and health issues I deal with now are still changing that game, and it's hard. Yeah. Okay, so we've we've talked a lot about sort of nuancing hope, thinking about some of the challenges that hope brings, um, but also at the same time, I think I think that there's still a way for hope to operate, right? Even when there's constraints, I think it's important to acknowledge what the constraints can be, mm-hmm. to expect hope to change. Mm-hmm. Um, so now that we're there, what next? Okay, so I've thought a lot about this because I tend to still be like a hopeful person and an, an acting person. I've at times needed to adjust that. And so I was thinking of that movie, The Quiet Place. Spoiler alert. <laughs> it's old enough to. It's old enough it, like, that you should have fault. seen it. Yeah. And if you haven't, it's awesome. You should. Yeah. Um, where the father, which Blair and I can't remember his name, so we'll call him Jim, Jim Halpert, Halpert yeah. <laughs> from The Office. At the end, you know, these creatures arrive and he's, he's there in the field. I think it's like a cornfield or something with his children. He knows the creatures are way stronger and faster than him and his children. Like, they can't, and they're confronted with these creatures. They're staring at him, right? He cannot just run away. The possibility that some random miracle occurs and a spaceship appears and saves him, maybe that's a possibility, but not realistically. And so where hope can play a factor here is there's this moment where Jim is like, you can see him thinking and he has to make a choice, right? If they all go run away, they have a chance of all dying. If they despair and just resign to the creatures, they all die. Same outcome. So the hope for all of them to live could kill them all. And the despair of not doing anything could kill them all. So he has this moment of maybe I could save my kids, right? And he decides to offer himself as a distraction to these creatures in the hope that maybe at least his kids could live, right? And so I think about that as, you know, the destructive side of hope as we can all try to live and just all matter, all the same and all be happy and never be frustrated, but that ends up killing us all. Or we can despair and do nothing and just resign to death, which sometimes is necessary and happens with people, right? With chronic or terminal illnesses, the end is just acceptance, right? And that's how you just let it go. And sometimes that is necessary and often the more peaceful and happy ending. Mm -hmm. But in these cases, how could we improve from utter destruction? Where is that opportunity, that sliver that could possibly end in something better? It's not certain that his kids will live. It's not certain that his kids will escape. But it's a possibility if he gives himself up here. 
Now, I have a hard time saying that because I'm not like parents should kill themselves for their children. Right. I don't believe in that. <laughs> right. And they don't have to. But there are certain things required in parenting that people don't talk about. But it's like your body will transform and that will create a different thing. And you there's, just have to accept that. Yeah, right. You're going to be you're not going to do some things that you could have done. Otherwise. Yeah. You just can't do those things. I'm always for saving as many lives as you can, including the parents, as, you know, like. But when that comes to that choice is when is when hope can kind of guide you to what could be done given this context right which leads me to this poem i wrote which is funny i had forgotten that i wrote this when i was preparing this and it's about hope in fact the title is called the way hope moves and i think what first led me to write this which was years ago it was published in segula is that how you say it yeah segula yeah segula years ago and it was written about my oldest daughter actually maybe my second i don't know it's about both of them (laughs) all of them no competition um about this moment that i would probably classify more as awe but i can see how it is also leads to hope so i'll read it real quick and then kind of talk about what that means for me as a mom yeah um so there was a moment at the aquarium today And I'm playing it over and over and over and over in my head because I'm obsessive like that. Between the splash and the glide of a penguin in a tank of water above us. The sunlight ragged, tattered, illuminating floating feces. Squatting, I held my daughter, one hand holding each side of her rib cage. And we looked up at the white belly of a penguin, a firm and round belly, like my daughter's belly after she swallowed a whole plate of homemade enchiladas, right as it swam into splintered sunlight cascading down an artificial sea. How we breathed, my daughter and I together, marveling. And inside, deep down in my crevices, in the slivers of my joints, something whispered, isn't that something? That last line actually is a line my great grandmother used once told my mom when she, when she was showing my mom a daddy long legs spider. So it has extra meaning for me there. But how this applies to hope for me is I feel like sometimes, I mean, often <laughs> as a parent, um, and I just know what it's like to be a mother. So I'll say, as a mother for me, is the water, the like aquarium water just feels so murky or sometimes it feel, looks like a rock and not even water <laughs> or lots of rocks and there's murky water in between. And that can lead to despair, right? Like this just always is hard. There's no ending. Every day's a battle <laughs> and I don't really win, right? In terms of joy or peace or even contentment. Like, this isn't fun. (laughs) Yeah. And then sometimes it's like you have those especially hard days where you feel like, I don't even feel like I'm learning from it. I don't even feel fulfilled by this. I feel like our relationships are being worse. Like, I just, this sucks, right? I feel like hope is a way of kind of orienting yourself and looking at that aquarium water, whatever, and seeing real slivers of light, not imagined and fake, right? And go kind of going toward there and hoping that like what's on the other side or up through that light is, is something that will make this okay. (laughs) Right. And so it's, Rather than despairing and resigning to the water is murky is where are these slivers of light that I can actually fit through and like I can reach toward that, I don't know, make my life, that can make my life okay or even beautiful. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. They're, they're not as common the older I get. Yeah. <laughs> but... They're still there. 
they're still there. And if I'm looking or if I'm even present enough to see or if that, you know, if that's what I'm trying to do each day, I can see them. But maybe that's just like a hopeful assumption I have. Back to hope. <laughs> so you are hopeful. I am. Are you really? Are you hopeful? Do you I don't know. It depends. Person? Yeah, it depends. I I feel both in me. Yeah. Are you a hopeful person? I don't know. I think so. I feel like the more I learn, the less hopeful I am. But then sometimes the more I learn, I'm like, oh, there's ways people have done this. Yeah. See, this is why I'm thinking about hope. And joy is another episode that I did because I'm rethinking these ideas. I'm, we must just kind of be at that age or something where we're just, you know, things are different than we might have expected. And we're, Yeah. We're, it's midlife. Yeah. It's that everything's not a dream and a possibility. Yeah. You're, it's the beginning of possibilities closing. Mm-hmm. And um, I have both in me because I don't want to lie to myself. Um, it's more like it's also kind of will and determination of like I refuse to be miserable. Yeah. <laughs> so I will find something here. Yeah, like I'll show misery. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let misery win. <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. That's Tara Boyce. She's a writer who earned a Master's of Arts in Writing and Rhetoric, and she writes at thisismyrestoration.substack. You can check that out for her essay that we talked about today and also a new essay about mothering. By the time this episode comes out, that'll be ready to read. So, Tara, thanks. This was really fun. Thank you. And hopeful. I hope <laughs> it was fun. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> a roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I hope you enjoyed this s'mores episode of Fireside with Blair Hodges. A little bonus for you. And if you stick around after this little outro, then you're going to hear some more bonus content, some of the deleted scenes from this episode. So stick around for that. Also, let me know what you thought about the s'mores episode. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also comment on the website. I always ask you to do stuff like that, but there's something different that I'm asking for this time. Fireside with Blair Hodges has been named a finalist in the Signal Awards, and this is one of podcasting's biggest award opportunities. Almost 2,000 podcasts entered, but only a few will emerge victorious, and Fireside is up for Best Podcast Award in the Indie category. So this is shows that aren't tied to any of the big podcasting networks or anything like that. Uh, and you can help me get a Listener's Choice Award in that category if you go to their website and vote for me. And I created a handy shortcut to make it easy for you. Just go to bit.ly slash vote fireside. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash vote fireside. And the site will ask you to sign up to vote. Uh, so you'll need to use a throwaway email address, uh, maybe your junk email address. Uh, but just use one email address. They're monitoring for spam voting and stuff, and it's only fair. Uh, vote once, but go to the website now and vote for me. bit.ly slash vote fireside. I would really appreciate that. By the way, when you vote, they're going to send you a confirmation email to confirm your vote. Don't forget to confirm that so your vote counts. Uh, lastly, in case you haven't heard yet, I'm working on a new show under the Fireside umbrella. It's debuting in January. The show's called Family Proclamations, and episodes will start popping up in your Fireside feed in January, and it will also be released through its own feed, so you can subscribe directly to Family Proclamations now in, in whatever app you're using. I cannot wait to share this show with you, and I thought I would throw the trailer in here to give you a sneak preview of what's coming up. See you soon, and don't forget to vote bit.ly slash vote Fireside. Hmm, is it that late? Dad'll be here any minute. Better tell Mother she's needed in the kitchen. Ah, yes, the classic nuclear family. Dad, Mom, two kids, a white picket fence, and everybody knows their role. I grew up believing this was the one right way to be a family, and I believed that until I started getting to know real people who didn't fit that mold. We're watching this old nuclear family model explode in real time, but we don't need to hit the panic button. We can let curiosity lead the way. I'm Blair Hodges, host of Family Proclamations. I'm on a quest to find out everything I can about family, gender identity, and sexuality, and I want you to join me. On this podcast, I'm talking to best-selling authors about marriage, divorce, cohabitation, single adulthood, parenting, childlessness, adoption, fostering, gender identity, human biology, and lots more. We'll learn about different families and identities, past, present, and future. So please get ready to surrender old stereotypes and embrace new perspectives. There's no single way to be a family, and every kind of family has something we can learn from. Check out Family Proclamations anywhere you get your podcasts and at familyproclamations.org.
presented by Fireside with Blair Hodges. Ah, dinner time. This is the time for pleasant discussion in a thoroughly relaxed mood.